back for episode six of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with my co-host, Sean Baker. And, and we have a, uh, an awesome guest, another content-heavy guy with us today with uh, Tucker. Yeah, Tucker Goodrich is here. It's going to be awesome to talk. And let's, let's, before we talk about it, you just got back off the plane. We're getting a late start here. You just got back from L.A. yesterday. You were on uh, Joe Rogan's show. And uh, what, what did you learn over there? How'd you go? I mean, when I, I was there in December, and he was putting in his float tank and still building his gym and hadn't quite put in the archery range. But what, what, what did he, how did he upgrade the studio? And how, 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 did he, how did he treat you? He treated me very well. So I just wonder how your experience was. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. He's got a... He's got a really cool facility there with all the bells and whistles um, for his uh, his playing around with the archery, weightlifting, all that stuff. And uh, yeah, it was a pretty sweet setup. So um, uh, had a fun time chatting with him about all, kind of all things ultra running and high fat diet. And uh, you know, it's Joe, so a little joking around as well. <laughs> Oh, well, good stuff, good stuff. Hey, uh, Tucker, give us a – because you got a lot of good stuff to talk about. Now, you know, I, I'm a big believer in, you know, this power of story and hearing people's personal anecdotes. And I, we talked about that with Amber the other day. We had Amber O'Hearn on, and she's got a great story too. But I don't want to spend a lot of time on the story because we got so much good science to talk about. So give us a brief, you know, five-minute synopsis of kind of who you are, what you're doing, and why you're where you are today. So, so we can start with that, and let's see where we go. Sounds great, Sean. Um, so I uh, have been in technology on Wall Street for most of my career. Um, the last 20 years working at a hedge fund, building uh, complicated risk systems to help run the business. Um, so I kind of have a mindset of problem solving because I was responsible for solving a lot of these problems ultimately. And if they didn't get fixed, then somebody got in big trouble, which ultimately meant I was in big trouble. Um, so I also was kind of a weekend warrior, but I had a bunch of health problems, uh, that constrained my, you know, sports activities. Um, so I, through some research and some dumb luck, managed to figure out how to resolve almost all of my issues, almost all of my health issues. And because I kind of have a curious bent to me. I didn't stop with, oh, it's fixed. Um, that, that's cool. I was like, wait a minute, this is fixed, but I had to do the reverse of everything I've been told to do for it to be fixed. So why is that the case? I wanted to understand these things and figure out why it was a benefit to me. Um, probably a personality flaw, but there you have it. Yeah, let me jump in real quick. I just, it, what you said is always fa is fascinating to me because like, I had a very similar introduction to kind of the high fat approach where um, I wouldn't say I was like falling apart, but there were definitely some kind of red flags that were popping up for me that I noticed were probably not ideal for at the time was a 25 year old male. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because like you jump into like trying some different stuff and you, you try to keep all, enough stuff consistent so that you know what you are changing is the thing that's going to either affect or not affect the, the, the outcome yes. change. And that, I think that's probably one of the questions I get the most of or the most skepticism I get when people ask like, well, you switched to this high fat diet, but how do you know it wasn't something else? And how do you know it wasn't placebo and all these other things? And, you know, I was like, it, it, it's, it's hard to explain, I think, but like when you have something kind of flip as drastically as it did, it's like, I, it's, for it to have been a placebo, I mean, that would be one powerful placebo, and if it were that easy, I would just mind will myself in all kinds of success, I guess. So, um, is that yes. kind of what you were thinking too? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, unlike you, I was falling apart. Um, I had been hospitalized a bunch of times. Um, I went through probably a period of borderline osteoporosis where I bo broke six bones in two years. Um, I spent four days in a stroke ward. I spent uh, probably eight days in a hospital with diverticulitis, which led to surgery. Um, I was in, I, I got to the point where I was in pretty rough shape. And, you know, because of my professional background, I'm extremely methodical when I go through these things, right? When I discovered, you know, for instance, I have a severe gluten sensitivity. When I first discovered it, I said, okay, 
no gluten for a week, then reintroduce it, see what happens, right? Add it back and forth, play around with the variables, see what my limits are. Um, you know, and I'm, you have to be that methodical because I've then sat down with doctors and when I explain all the steps that I go, go through to figure out what my problems are, especially with my personal doctor, he pretty quickly realized that I was a reliable reporter, right? That's what they're looking for. Somebody who tells them an anecdote that makes sense and they know that you're being rigorous enough so they can count on what you're telling them. Yeah, so this is an interesting, you know, a couple points, you know, I found that, you know, as I've been sort of getting into this sort of alternate world of diet and fitness and health, you know, it's kind of leaving the uh, sort of the standard medical practice, you know, I've seen that a lot of, you know, very intelligent people that probably had an, enough good sense not to go into medicine are solving some of these problems. You've got engineers and other people like yourself that are, you know, confronted with these complicated health issues. And, you know, there's a concept of skin in the game. And I've seen some of the, the most knowledgeable people about certain medical conditions are the people that suffer from them, not the doctors that treat them. Because, you know, it's it's your life literally depends upon you figuring this stuff out. And these people, you know, the, mo the, the ones that are, you know, have, have the intelligence and the motivation to uh, dig into the literature and really test that are really teaching us some things. And I think this is something we can't discount. I think your experience is just another one of a long line of examples where we're seeing this over and over again. I think as a profession in general, we, we would do well to really take heed and listen to these anecdotes and not just rely on, you know, uh, a university funded, stud, uh, funded study all the time. And, and, and you know, because there's, there, again, skin in the game is, is, a, is a very powerful motivator. Studies take too long, right? right? No. When they answer all these questions that we're discussing, we're all going to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and, and I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's the ethical, you know, a lot of them aren't even ethical, you know, so you can't, you can't, a lot of them, you know, like, well, we're not going to do that. You know, it's like, uh, we're not going to put a bunch of people on high cholesterol cause diet, you know, and study that because they're all going to die of heart disease. So we can't even study that stuff. So it's, it's kind of interesting how, how that, that turns out. Yeah, we're we're kind of in a in a scenario where I think it's like you're gonna be the best guide to like understanding like kind of like how you, where your health is at uh, for in most cases. Like if you're feeling good and things are working well, that's probably a pretty good sign that things are operating in a in a good way. And if, so if you're honest with yourself and you know your things are kind of firing on all cylinders, so to speak, you you're probably doing something right. So um, yeah, the doctor can tell you can only tell you so much and then like like you said Tucker um, if you bring in all kinds of information for them that's probably when they're able to connect some dots for you and maybe tell you what's going on as opposed to just um, kind of trying to push you in a direction that maybe wouldn't work for you yeah and also I you know a really important point is I can be extremely critical about doctors in the medical profession, but they offer real value and they have a level of experience that an individual like me who just has my own problems doesn't have. So ideally it's got to be, you know, it's got, there's got to be some level of partnership there. Yeah. No yeah. Problem. I mean, I, I agree with that for sure. You know, one of the, one of the, sometimes, oh, actually our system where so many such a hurry now. And if a patient comes in with 16 charts and, you know, five years worth of history, you know, a lot of times the doctors say, well, I got 10 minutes, man. <laughs> yes, exactly. What can we do? And it's, 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 so it's frustrating because you really want to spend that time, but you, the system doesn't allow it. And I don't think it's an individual physician's fault sometimes. It's just a system that we've, we've kind of set up and designed for ourselves. It's, you know, I kind of liken it to an assembly line. I mean, it's just turnover, turnover, turnover. And that's how the hospitals keep the lights on. That's, that's how they pay their bills. And, you know, you're, and it's just getting worse all the time. We're just kind of pushed to do that sort of stuff. And so I think that, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not really set up well for collaboration, unfortunately. But Tucker, let's, let's talk about, because um, you got some neat stuff you want to talk about, about performance. But here's a question that a lot of people ask. It's just kind of a weird thing. And I know you, you kind of delved into this, but a lot of people will say, hey, I want a low carb diet or a keto diet or a carnivore, carnivore diet, and I don't get sunburned as much anymore. Can you briefly give us, a, give us a primer on why the heck that's going on? What's the deal with not getting sunburned as much? Well, Sean's bringing this up because we've discussed this on Twitter a fair bit, and lots of people <laughs> seem to chime in and say, hey, I don't get sunburned anymore either. I thought it was just me. Um, so I am, if for people who are listening to the podcast here and can't see my face, pale, blonde hair, blue eyes, right? I go 
I used to go to the beach and I would um, turn into a lobster in about 45 minutes. Um, so after I read, I think it was on Mark Sisson's blog, one of his success stories where the guy mentioned that his sunburn tolerance went up, right? And I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. And what got me interested in starting to fix my diet was um, a post on Stefan Goyenet's blog where he discussed this mouse model of skin cancer, whereby adjusting the amount of omega-6 fats in the diet of these mice, they could control how fast they sunburned and how fast they got skin cancer. So that was the thing that kind of made me say, wow, I should, you know, on the day when I finally decided to start fixing my diet, that was one of the main stories that was in my mind. Um, so fast forward a couple of weeks, only a couple of weeks, and I went skiing and on a sunny March day, I'm out in the sun all day. I hate sunscreen. I never use sunscreen, always have hated sunscreen. And, you know, the next morning I looked in the mirror and I was like, I'm not burned. It's like, wow, that's kind of weird. Um, but as I said, I'm pretty methodical. <laughs> so I did a I did a controlled experiment. Um, Zach, you probably know a guy named Barefoot Ted. Yes. Okay. So Barefoot Ted was doing a barefoot running uh, seminar in New York City in Central Park in April before the leaves come out on the trees out here. And I went in with my now ex-wife, uh, who is Colombian, dark skin, dark complexion, turns chestnut brown in the sun. Um, we went into this seminar that Barefoot Ted was doing and sat outside in the sun for two and a half hours, side by side, right? We get home that night and she turns to me and she says, look how burned I got out there. And I turned to her and I said, look at me. I didn't burn at all. She was blown away. She was a beach person. I would never go to the beach, right? Why does the lobster go in the pot? I would never <laughs> go to the beach. <laughs> so and all of a sudden, two and a half hours, side by side, standing in the same sun, she burned and I didn't. Blew both our minds. And I'm not going to say, so my burn time has gone from 45 minutes to probably six or seven hours. Um, I mean, on Sunday, I was up in Vermont, skied eight hours and bluebird day on the, sun, on the snow with the sun reflecting up in my face. And I got a tiny little bit of peeling on my nose here. No sunscreen. Well, so that's, that's I, been night and day, and a lot of people come back with that same story. Well, I'm sure that's just a placebo effect, but... Um, yeah. <laughs> that increase... Like standing the, in a nuclear reactor. The seven-hour increase in sun tolerance is definitely a placebo effect. But, yeah, so a right. question, question about that. You said you kind of looked into it a bit and found that it was something to do with the omega-6 fatty acids. That was um, either... I didn't catch it. Yes. Either uh, encouraging the burn or the removal of them or lowering of them allowed you to not burn as much as what you're thinking or so one of the problems with uh omega-6 fats is that they're which is um just to kind of back up quickly for people vegetable oils mm -hmm. seed oils is a little more specific things like soybean oil corn oil canola oil are made from the seeds of plants and baked they are the uh oils that tend to contain a lot of these omega-6 fats they are very unstable um, right, and they break down to toxins. Toxin is not too strong a word to use. If you go look up these chemicals, toxin is the word, is how they are described. Um, so one of the things that will cause them to break down is ultraviolet light and blue light, right? So obviously ultraviolet light is what causes your skin to burn. So what seems to happen, and I found a couple of studies that describe this, is as you eat more seed oils, the omega-6 fatty acid content of your body goes up and you become basically more susceptible to having these fats break down into the toxins. That's what causes the skin to burn, right? The toxins are actually causing the burn, not the UV light. Now yes, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Tucker. No, I was going to say, there's a, a similar condition in the eye called age-related macular degeneration which is the primary source of blindness in the Western world. And it's the same problem, effectively, right? Except in this case, ultraviolet light can't get to your retina, but uh, blue light can. And blue light also causes these fats to break down. And they've now, I've heard people explicitly say, 
omega-6 fats seem to be the cause of age-related macular degeneration. So it's, you know, there's, when you say it, it sounds crazy. There's a good bit of research out there to back these crazy statements up. And, you know, like Zach was saying, there's these seven hours of sun tolerance. I mean, I moved down to Texas for a year and would go out running in the middle of the day for three and a half hours, no sunscreen, no burn, right? I got a little pink the first time and then was tan the next morning, which is normal. That's what you're supposed to do, right? We evolved under the sun. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we, we didn't, we weren't. If we weren't running around putting sunscreen and hiding, you know, hiding in caves yeah. the whole time. I, we went outside. Amazing. That's crazy. That's yeah, crazy. Exactly. Yeah. So, do you think, like, with the with the omega six thing, is there something to like the ratio of omega three to omega six that plays a part in that, or is it just simply reducing the omega sixes down as low as you can get them? Uh, uh, in well, in, let me before you, before you answer, Tucker. I mean, omega six sure. are essential. I mean, we have to have them in our diet to some degree. Am I, am I mistaken in that? I mean, that, that is something we need, right? That's a great point to make. Not only, not only are they essential, but they're in all real foods, mm -hmm. right? So if you're eating a real food, whole food diet, you're going to get some omega-6s. That's not the problem. The problem is the concentrated sources that okay. have, you know, come into our diet through these seed oils, which are only about 120 years old um, as a major part of the human diet. Um, to answer the other question, the ratio in age-related macular degeneration, the ratio only matters if the omega-6 fats are low, right? If you try and, if you don't decrease the omega-6 fats and you just try and increase the omega-3 fats to offset them, it doesn't work. And there's a lot of biochemistry about how these fats get processed through the body that explains that, but that's probably a little more detail than we want to go into. Sure, so you can't You're just double, double down on salmon and omega-3 capsules to kind of remedy the situation. You have to actually kind of treat it, treat it as so a you can't, Yeah, you can't just eat a bunch of donuts and then say, I'm going to have a piece of fish and say, I'm okay, right? That's, that's not how it works. Right, and it's actually an issue in Japan where obviously they eat a lot of fish, and they probably have different health issues than we do because they eat so much fish, but... They are very explicit about oh, about it over there, where they say our people are not as healthy as they should be because they're eating too many of these oils, hmm. and they're they're also eating more omega threes than anybody else in the world. Is but, there anything is there anything qualitatively different about the omega sixes that are obtained from seed oils versus things that come in natural foods like you know animal fats or other sources of omega six that we might find? Uh, are, they, are they basically just the same? They're the same. It doesn't okay. really matter. It's the it's the it's the quantity the absolute, that matters. It's not amount. The, okay. Right. Not the source. So moderation is key, I suppose, with with that one as well as many other things. Well, yep. moderation is only helpful if you know what the right dose is, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that I mean, moderate's great, right? A moderate amount of cyanide is zero. A moderate amount <laughs> of alcohol relative, is a yeah. lot. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So basically, minimize to the degree you can. Let me, because there is a there is a thought about this MAC ratio that we're supposed to eat. Do you know where that came from? I, my understanding is they may have looked at indigenous populations and said, well, this is the ratio of omega-6 they got, so therefore, that must be the ideal ratio. I don't know that they really have a great sort of scientific explanation for what that ratio is. Are you aware of any, any science behind where those ratios came from? Well, yeah, that science came from looking at uh, the ratios in wild animals, right? It's basically comes out of the paleo diet, as far as I understand it, right? How much of these fats are in a wild animal? And to your favorite topic, Sean, when people <laughs> ask me, what are the ratios that I eat and what are the quantities that I eat? I say, eat beef. That's the per arguably the only super food, right? People can eat nothing but beef, ideally nose to tail, and be perfectly healthy. So how much omega-6 and omega-3 fats are in beef? Not much, but it's a pretty balanced ratio. It's like one to one or one to four. But there's not a lot in beef, and there's not a lot in most wild animals. So, you know, it's not, if you're eating a healthy diet, you should never worry about it. But your healthy diet should be avoiding it. Yeah, that's interesting. So let me ask you because this is a topic that I know Zach and I have, have seen this, you know, the same sort of results. You know, talk when we talk about exercise, I know you wanted to talk about 
uh, you know, performance and exercise in this in this show here today. Um, I noticed really good recovery. I mean, it's 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 very objective to me. I mean, as as you know, compared to where I was three or four years ago, my recovery is much improved from where it was. I know Zach has noted improvements in recovery in his journey going from a you know a carb fuel athlete to a to a relatively low carb fuel athlete. Is there do, do the do the fat do the omega sixes have a role in that, or is there something else that's, that's that potentially is doing that? And have you seen the same sort of thing? I've seen not only do I recover faster, but one of the weirdest things that I've noticed is when I do get injured. So I, I trail run, I mountain bike, I ski, right? I get doing those things. I get hurt a fair bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you kick rocks as Zach knows when you're out on the trail, when you're mountain biking, you fall off at speed and you get, you know, and when you you know, when you ski, you fall down, you hit rocks. Um, so I get hurt a fair bit. So I have a pretty good data set. Um, the first time I really noticed this, I was in a ski house and I slipped and fell down the stairs, right? And I got up and I was a little shaken up and, you know, but I was all right. So I went out. Did next, next morning or no, that evening I got home, I got in the shower and I looked in the mirror and I noticed there was this huge bruise across the back of my arm. Never noticed it, right? The, my pain tolerance has gone up an, an amazing amount. Now, there are a bunch of studies where they look explicitly at uh, the breakdown products of these omega-6 fats can induce pain. There's a study where they reduced the omega-6 intake, intake of people with chronic headaches and the people saw their headaches improve. So pain tolerance got to the point where at one point I was like, do I have leprosy? Because Sean, as a doctor, knows what happens in leprosy is you lose the feeling to your periphery, right? That's what kills lepers is they get infections from these cuts that they can't feel. And I was coming back from mountain bikes, you know, with my cuts on my legs, and I couldn't remember when they happened. Mm -hmm. Bleeding, and I'm like, wow, when did that happen? It doesn't hurt. Um, the other interesting thing and I've, that goes along with sunburn is an increased resistance to burning from heat. Um, George Henderson, who's another fellow on Twitter, we all know, has commented on this. I've noticed it. My ex-wife noticed it. You know, mainly cooking, fats spill on your skin, and it doesn't burn you. It hurts, but you wash it off and there's no burn there. It's kind of bizarre. The recovery thing... Yeah, I mean, I just you know, when I'm when I'm cooking bacon naked, I sometimes notice that too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> By the way, don't do that <laughs> for all you kids at home. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, you know, you spill fat on your hands, or I cook barefoot, and which is a bad idea. And you know, sometimes you spill stuff off the stove. Um, but so these breakdown products, um, they. You know, they cause cellular level damage in your body, right? Um, and they cause significant... So, okay, so let me give you an example of what I think is causing this. Um, why we, the three of us, and a lot of other people have noticed much better recovery and a lot less soreness after activities. Um, traumatic brain injury, right? Concussion is something that we are hearing... It feels to me like we are hearing a lot more about this than I remember when I was a kid, right? When I was a kid, kids would get a concussion and it was like no big deal. It seemed to be no big deal. Maybe we were all just missing out on it. Um, what happens in a traumatic brain injury is the shock wave in your brain actually causes the omega-6 fats in your brain to break down into these toxic byproducts, right? It doesn't happen immediately. It takes about 24 hours. So the damage to your brain in a concussion isn't instant, which is why often people think they're fine initially. It's over the course of 24 hours, right? They've got clear data of these, you know, the omega-6 fats in your brain, which are a natural part of your brain, breaking down into these toxins. They see the same thing in Alzheimer's. Um, so what seems to be happening is as we've been eating these fats more and more, it's become a bigger and bigger part of our diet over the last hundred years. The content in our body has gone up steadily and we've become 
fragile, more fragile if you want to think about it, right? We've replaced this very robust, solid, imper almost impervious, saturated fats that are in animal foods with these extremely fragile fats that break down into toxins in your body and cause cellular level damage. Um, one of the things, um, so I think that's why we, that's why we see a lot of, you know, if you start going to a healthy diet and you start minimizing these fats, you start eating more beef, you start getting, you know, beef is amazing because it has a couple of antioxidants that directly protect you against the breakdown pro products of omega-6 fats like carnosine, um, is that you're literally altering the damage pathways that are, the damage and pain pathways that are occurring in your body because essentially what's happening is they're getting overwhelmed by having too much of these fats in our bodies. Yeah, that is, I mean, that's, I think something that's underappreciated. I know there's a, there's been a real large focus on sugar. I know with Gary Tobbs' work, you know, he, everybody's put kind of really come off come after sugar, and you've kind of been out there saying, wait a minute, there's something. You know, we well, invented we invented Crisco in 1914, whatever mm -hmm. year they invented Crisco, and that's when it all that's when we see a lot of this stuff too. So, obviously, I think there's you know we can't just point our finger at one thing and say no, it's all the sugar, it's all the or high fructose corn syrup, or it's all the uh, the, the omega six oils. But I mean, certainly there's a, there's I'm, a I'm, I'm all in favor of the argument about sugar, but I, I personally stopped eating added sugar 30 years ago. So it's nice that everybody's come along to join me in that, mm -hmm. right? I did it because of dental problems and cavities, but I still got fat and I still got sick. And I was, I was eating so little sugar every year. You know, I was reading labels for 30 freaking years. So yes, that's a problem, but it doesn't explain what happened to me, right? It doesn't explain yeah. all the problems I had and how I was able to fix all those things because I wasn't cutting sugar out of my diet because it wasn't there in the first place. Yeah, I look at the the donut as a perfect example of the the, <laughs> the, the trifecta of evil. You know, in the diet we've got the refined you know the refined grain products, we've got the vegetable oils, and we've got the sugar, and that should be that should be public number one in my view. But uh, the you donut know, is the neutron bomb of the American well, diet. Sure, yes. <laughs> sure, that's it. it. Takes out the people and leaves leaves the buildings standing. Yeah, that's that's interesting stuff, um, especially when you get into the good balance and everything with. Uh, with the omega sixes and kind of how those have more or less crept into our our typical kind of go to foods. When you think of what a, what a normal person who's not really paying attention to much is going to find themselves getting, like they might hear that health advice or like you know don't eat butter, it's bad for you, and then they'll get the I can't believe it's not butter, and then they're going straight down that that uh, path that you just described, um, and then uh, you know a host of other things as well. They're kind of like that 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 fake food kind of type of stuff where. We're trying to limit certain things by replacing with something else that ends up being like way worse for people. Um, I want to actually ask to kind of follow up a little bit on the whole recovery thing as long as we're on that topic a bit, because this is something we kind of started talking about on, on Joe Rogan's podcast too. We didn't quite come full circle because we got a little distracted by something else. But um, when, when it comes to recovery, I actually think when it comes to training and recovery, I actually think like recovery is the more important variable in terms of uh, how low you can kind of bring your carbohydrates down or or how effectively I guess you can go on like a really low more of a like strict ketogenic diet because one thing I'll notice and I noticed this quite early when I started messing around with a high fat approach was it wasn't necessarily that I was any less sore the next day after like an ultra marathon but rather than kind of spending two weeks after a race kind of slowly getting back into it and you know doing basically nothing but really easy slow kind of sluggish type runs that two weeks after uh, when I kind of switched to the high fat side of things I was able to still take the same amount of days off right after but then once I got back into it it was like I was ready to go I didn't have to waste a whole lot of time and um, and the one thing I, I discovered once too is I did a I did. I can't remember what race it was, but I did it, and then I took like three or four days completely off, and ended right. ended up. Uh, I was coaching a high school track and field team at the time, and uh, they were doing a 400 meter workout, and I just jumped in with one of the one of the guys who was trying to hit a specific split, uh, and you know we were they were, they were 
they were pretty comparable to what I'm normally doing when I'm kind of hitting 400s in full stride. And uh, I was able to do them no problem. And I had gone basically like strict keto for those four days following the workout or following that race. So it wasn't like I was carbo loading or carb sneaking for that workout, but I was still able to execute a pretty high intense workout. So that kind of got me thinking like it's sometimes I think like we get stuck on this thing like carbs are for intense stuff, uh, fats are for low, slow stuff. But then we see someone like Sean Baker who's, you know, doing nothing but high intensity stuff with essentially a zero carb diet and um, still coming back and being able to do those at a high level. So, like, that makes me think that there's that variable of recovery that plays a big role because he's also got, you know, a solid 23 hours probably between workouts to kind of let, you know, fats and proteins restock some of those glycogen stores as opposed to having to, like, go to the carbs to kind of get ready for a workout maybe three or four hours after that one. Is that kind of something you've seen in some of your endurance stuff too? Well, it, let's just be clear here. I don't do uh, the kind of endurance that Zach does. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, well, no, nobody does it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, he, uh, yeah, a few years back, Zach commented, well, I'm not thinking about doing the longer stuff just yet. And he was referring to what, the 72 hour race? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, for me, the longest thing I've ever done was like eight ish hours, a mountain bike race. Um, I'm more, you know, but yeah, I've, I've seen a huge difference in recovery. It's not, you know, the weird thing for me personally about people who worry about carbohydrates and activity. So I like to ski, right. And I like to ski, um, moguls. Uh, which is an, ex an extremely intense activity, but only for like four or five minutes as you're going down a slope. And it's constant. Um, basically, you're constantly pushing your body away from the ground. So I guess that's an eccentric. Uh, you're working your quads eccentrically, right? Mm -hmm. Is that right, Sean? I'm assuming you're the expert on this stuff. I'm, I'm relying on you. Eccentric well, I mean is, is when you're pushing away, not... Yeah, I mean, you know the act of contraction of the muscle when you're when you're you know like when you're flexing your bicep up, that's a concentric activity. When you're lowering it down, that's going to be eccentric. So when you're going, right. the, you know, away from the when you're when you're lengthening rather than shortening. Okay, the muscle. Right. So, so what I noticed immediately, um, the, you know, the typical thing when you were skiing is you would get this burn in your quads, right? And before I fixed my diet, my typical routine when I was skiing is I would ski down these mogul fields, which, you know, sometimes could be five or ten minutes long, very high intensity. You get to the bottom soaked in sweat and panting. And I would do this until I was shaking. And then I would go in and I would get a plate of uh, French fries <laughs> <laughs> and carbo load and repeat and go out until I was shaking again and repeat. Um, so when I decided to switch, um, when I switched my diet, you know, I had a lot of theories about what was going to happen, but I basically fueled myself on coffee in half and half. And not only did I not get to the point where I was shaking anymore, but the burn in my quads went away entirely. I mean, I was out last weekend and I skied all day until literally I was worried that my legs were going to collapse under me and I didn't have any burn in my legs in the muscles at all, right? So not only are you not... Now, you know, DOMS is every athlete's favorite little treat a couple days after a workout. DOMS is another one of these processes where the uh, fat, you know, the omega-6 fats are breaking down in your muscles and causing damage. My DOMS has gone down dramatically. I mean, I can beat the daylights out of my legs and I don't have two or three days of soreness, you know, I have a little twinge and that's it. So people are, you know, my personal experience taking carbs out of the diet, you know, my recovery went up, but also my performance went up almost immediately. Yeah, Just, I, and it was weird things like the lack of burning. I have a video of me one day when I actually did eat French fries at lunch and I went out with a bunch of friends. And I was complaining about how much my legs were burning. And I was like, oh, my God, that's when I noticed it. I was like, 
you know, I eat French fries at lunch, I eat a plate full of carbs, and now I've got this pain in my legs, and it wasn't there all morning, it wasn't there yesterday. Yeah, it's interesting, and just to clarify, DOM stands for delayed onset of muscle soreness for the people that aren't acute into that term, and that's something that typically right. occurs right. often when you have an exercise in a while and you exercise a muscle group, and you get that pain usually about 48 hours afterwards, and then the, the pain you experience acutely, you know, a lot of people attribute it to the dissociation of hydrogen ions from lactic acid, so when that lactic acid is produced, and the, the lactate and the, the, uh, the hydrogen ions go to different ways. I've noticed that also myself when I was at these high levels of, you know, trying to break these world records on the, on the concept two rowing machine where you get just tremendous amounts of lactate buildup and it would be very painful. And that's one of the things, you know, if you can push through that pain, you can, you can, uh, you know, you can have a better performance. Well, I found out I had less pain, so I was kind of cheating a little bit because I didn't have to put right. as much pain to get those high levels of performance. And so, uh, you know, this is, you know, this, this stuff occurs, you know, as you probably know, Zach, at the higher intensity stuff. And that's why just the, the long distance stuff, you're not, you're not feeling that acute you know, glycolytic type of lactate producing burn that I think we're talking about here. I don't know if you have something so well, he'll, in, in, he'll get it bombing down a hill on a trail race. Down a That's hill. The exact same. And and the other one would be if you're if you have a pretty steep climb and you're kind of putting the gas pedal down a little bit, you can get a little bit of that kind of burning sensation in your quads too. Um, yeah. So you're you're saying like like the post work like the, the DOMS is the breakdown of the omega-6 is causing like an inflammatory response that's really resulting in that that pain is that kind of what you're saying is going on that's exactly right the breakdown products of the omega-6 fats there's a chemical called hne that specifically causes both a pain response and inflammation directly okay it induces inflammation this is nice this is one thing, because we always talk about chronic inflammation, acute inflammation. You know, inflammation is, is kind of a normal response for, as part of a reparative process. And so I think, you know, we, we always talk about I'm inflamed. We just really say I'm damaged, and, and, I'm, and inflammation is a consequence of that. And it's not necessarily the inflammation that's causing the problem. It's the damage you already had, and the inflammation is a reaction to, to that damage. So we're, 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 we're creating damage now. The inflammatory process is there to kind of mop things up, basically. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. The inflammation is the healing, the beginning, the first step of the healing process. Inflammation is never a cause. It's always a response, as you just said. Something else had to happen for the inflammation response to start. Um, and yeah, what seems to be, you know, there are clear links between the DOMS, TBI, all these sort of slow starting pain mechanisms seem to have a similar similar mechanism causing them. Um, you know, the other thing I'd like to mention um, that certainly is of concern to all athletes is, and this is a little more hypothetical, um, the, so I got a tiny little knee injury at one point that made me hyper conscious about my knees. Um, and a few years back, I looked into, uh, when I started skiing again, my knees started bothering me. So I started looking in, into knee injuries. Uh, and I discovered something that I thought was pretty amazing. Um, the ACL injury is, Sean, you would know better than I, but it's probably the most common knee injury nowadays. Is that fair to say? Well, I would, say, I, I would say, well, severe injury probably. I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of smaller, smaller injuries, cartilage injuries and meniscal damage, which we'd see more commonly. But an ACL is a very common injury, and it's become more common, you know, in the last it's, several decades, you know, particularly, and we're seeing it in younger and younger athletes, too. And so it's, a, it's, it's becoming a more common injury for sure. Right. So what, but what I learned that blew my mind, the ACL injury was first described in the 1960s at West Point in the football program. So it's a recent injury that's become epidemic, right? So how does a cartilage injury become epidemic? Well, I think, you know, I think that's, I think there's a lot of biology behind that. I think we, you know, as, as orthopedic surgeons, we've always sort of, we're taught, you know, mechanics and uh, joint reactive forces and all these things that, that we, we really spent a lot of time, you know, micromanaging and worrying about, but we kind of totally blew, blew past the whole biology. You know, we kind of put that in the background because we couldn't really affect it. You know, we didn't have a hammer that could change your biology. So we kind of, you know, that, that the stuff kind of got put off to the side. and We didn't really, you know, pay much attention to it. It's only now that we're starting to see a little bit more data coming out. That there's, you know, these damaging 
whether they're advanced glycation end products or mixed metalloproteinases or, you know, probably I know you talk about the advanced, you know, ALEs, I guess advanced lipid end products that, that, that come in there and have an effect on the biology. And they, they, they weaken the structure, they weaken the material, and then those mechanical factors are, are you know, multiply. So now you've got it, you know, it's like, you know, putting your house on sand instead of bedrock. You know, now you've got this weak foundation, you know, biologically, right. and now it just falls apart. So yeah, right. we're seeing we're seeing people's tissue quality get worse, and we're seeing it at, at younger ages, and that's why, you know, some of the you know I think some of the early signs of metabolic disease are injury in a lot of cases. You know, that's the key point. You just made my point. People's tissue quality is getting worse, right? If you take animals of any species and you look at what their car the composition of their cartilage is when they're born, and then you start feeding them seed oils, omega-6 fats, the cartilage composition changes in weeks, right? All, it seems to be a fundamental, fundamental mechanism of cartilage breakdown and the fibrosis that you see as a result of the damage in the cartilage. Um, thankfully, I haven't had any cartilage injuries to test whether or not I am more responsive to it, but based on, you know, the the research I've done, I think that's probably the key mechanism because a lot of the, you know, when you take um, the typical treatment for uh, os for arthritis is COX-2 inhibitors, right? That or NSAIDs, which treat the pain but don't actually pro uh, affect the progression of the disease. That's an omega-6 pathway that the COX-2 inhibitors are blocking. Right, and what seems to be happening is they're blocking one part of the pathway, but the chemicals like H and E that cause the cartilage breakdown and the fibrosis buildup are happening simultaneously all around that as the COX two pathway has been blocked, which is why the damage continues, even though part of the path, the pain part of the pathway has been blocked. Yeah, I mean the 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 COX two inhibitors, you know, Celebrex and Vax, which came off the market, some of the other ones, you know. Uh, Mobic, uh, those things are you know widely prescribed, you know, and, and, and yes, they're very common. Same with you know the other classic NSAIDs like, you know, just ibupro ibuprofen, you know, aspirin, yeah. but I, all these all these nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that we utilize heavily, and they all have, uh, you know, they, you know, I, I used to prescribe the hell out of them. Now I'm like I would I would hesitate to give anybody those things at this point. It's just it's just kind of scary what we're finding about this stuff. You know, I think the whole thing is we're finding out so much stuff. Just in general about health, nutrition, and medicine, these things that we thought were we were doing the right thing, when it turns out, man, we were just basically making things worse. And I think it's uh, uh, just interesting to watch it unravel and, and uh, a little bit scary at the same time. Yeah, it's a little bit scary. Well, as I said, I went through, you know, I broke six bones in two years after not having a broken a bone since I was a teenager, and. You know, that was the last the last one I snapped my thumb when I fell skiing. Just the tip of it just snapped because I fell on the ground. And that's when I started to think to myself, uh oh, something's going wrong, which was right in the middle of all of my hospitalizations and all the rest of the stuff that was going on. And that was eight years ago. I still fall. I still hit fall and hit rocks hard at speed. And now nothing happens. You know, it's it's a night and day difference from what I was experiencing prior, almost as noticeable as the sunburn difference and what and i don't think we we fully you know suss that out but i mean you you said before you were you changed now i assume you had a dietary change i mean what, what was the difference yeah. in the diet back then because we didn't really touch on that so the the unlike um everybody else i've ever talked to the first you know as i said i'd been avoiding sugar for a long time because of cavities um so when i started learning about diets, um, the first thing I took out of my diet was seed oils. Um, I had been sick for 16 years at that point with irritable bowel syndrome. Um, I'd had eight inches of my colon taken out because of diverticulitis. Um, when I took the seed oils out of my diet, the IBS went away in two days. Wow, um, that's interesting. After 16 years. It went away in two days. And I mean, I was bad enough to the point where I had to travel with a roll of toilet paper. I mean, if I went out on a trail run or a mountain bike ride, I had to bring a roll of toilet paper along. Not fun. <laughs> 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 it's, 
let me uh, just just go just go on that point. Now we are told that you know if you have gastrointestinal issues that we need to we need to treat it with fiber and more fiber. What is your thought on on that particular uh, sentiment? Yeah, fiber is the biggest scam. I mean, so when I was in the hospital with I so I had acute diverticulitis diverticulitis, which is a perforation in the colon. Um, which is an extremely painful thing to have happen to you if you don't know. Um, and the doctor came in, the surgeon came in, and I remember clearly him telling me, um, you know, you're not going to be able to eat any more fatty fried foods. And I looked at him and I was like, I can't eat fatty fried foods. They make me nauseous. I've been avoiding them for 20 years. And he's like, well, you're going to eat more fiber. And, you know, and I was like, I was like, all I eat is salads and whole Whole wheat, for God's sake! What am I? How am I going to eat more? <laughs> <laughs> and, but I did. I tried to eat more, and six months later, they had to cut eight inches of my colon out because it didn't work. Um, and what I've noticed, you know, when you have IBS, you spend a lot more time than you probably ought to paying attention to what comes out of the south end. There's a clear correlation even today with the amount of fiber in my diet and the quality of my bowel movements. And more is not better. I mean, yeah, that's that's interesting that you say that because um, you know I I kind of I guess learned through experience as well, but probably not quite as painstakingly as you did. Um, I haven't had like full blown irritable bowel syndrome or anything like that. But one thing I did notice when I started switching to kind of the high fat diet at first, I saw like vegetables, essentially like non-starchy vegetables as this great vehicle for fat. Like, you know, you make a big salad and you can just douse it with oil or something like that. And you have like a pretty low carb, um, very high fat kind of scenario there. But what I noticed is there's, there is a definite diminishing return on that, on the fiber, like the amount of fiber you put in. Cause like, you know, unless you want to be, spending spending an extra 20 30 minutes a day in the bathroom it's like you <laughs> <laughs> and you know i brought it i brought it way down now and i i'll eat only cooked vegetables i mean every once in a while i'll have a salad with like raw spinach on there but um that's getting pretty rare now too and um it, i'll have some cooked vegetables or grilled vegetables every once in a while or what i try to do the most is get fermented vegetables if i'm going to do anything like that um, and it's, I mean, it's a, it makes a big difference. It's like you said, like, um, the, the contents of your bowel movement is, is drastically better, especially if you look at like any, if you, if you do, if you do a small search on kind of like what your bowel movement should be looking like for looking like versus what is not necessarily ideal for digestion, you can kind of get an idea. Oh, and they about. have charts, God help yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it's, called, it's called the Bristol Stool, stool Score, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah, well, yeah, they, they and the, classify them from one, zero to seven, I think, the, or one the, to seven. The interesting thing to me, too, is, like, you can get an idea of how probably abnormal people's bowel movements really are because when you look at the poop emoji on, like, the cell phone, it's, like, the worst plum for the Bristol bar <laughs> stool. So... <laughs> Like, uh, <laughs> it's, it's actually, yeah, it's, uh, people don't always understand that. I don't think they think of like fiber as something that's cleaning out their pipes. And really it's like, you know, cardboard would do the same thing and we're not eating cardboard. Cardboard is fiber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally the same. <laughs> yeah. So, so what do you think about like just any type of micronutrients advantages to vegetables? Like, or not necessarily advantages, but just. You know, people thinking about, well, I want to get in, you know, my green vegetables. Like, it, do you feel like there is a place for that? Or is that kind of like a trial by, you know, like on yourself where you just kind of like find out for yourself if you're eating too much or or uh, not enough of that type of stuff? Yeah, Sean and I have gone back and forth on this on Twitter quite a bit. And I personally don't see the need to go fully carnivore, but... There are, as far as I know, and I've read about this extensively, no nutrients of any kind that are exclusively available from vegetables, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I get a little apprehensive sometimes about a fully carnivore diet just because, you know, 100% carnivore, just muscle meat, is a pretty rare diet. But there's nothing you can point to, you know, 
I mean, the Inuit, the Eskimos, were 99% of the way there. Mm -hmm. They'd eat some blueberries a couple times a year, right? Mm -hmm. And they're healthy. Uh, I mean, they have their own health issues, but it doesn't have anything to do with their diet. Um, so I personally, you know, I find that if I go, I go in and out, I find that if I don't eat any vegetables for a little while, I'll crave them, but it's not much. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think some's fine, in, you know, I personally think some's fine in your diet, but I'm pretty flexible. I mean, I've got a daughter who does really badly with tomatoes, raw tomatoes. Sure. So, okay, don't eat raw tomatoes. If they yeah. bother you, don't. You know, I mean, I I personally love hot peppers. They don't love me back. So I'll have tiny little doses that I can tolerate. Sure. But, I mean, that's kind of an easy call because, you know, peppers is what they make pepper spray from, and that's a bioweapon. So <laughs> if you're eating a bioweapon and you have a bad reaction to it, you shouldn't be shocked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just a little side but, note with the tomatoes, too. I, I just read somewhere, because someone was interested or curious as to why they didn't have, like, weird stomach issues from eating this, like, specific type of, like, Italian-based uh, pasta sauce, but they had horrible reactions to just your normal, like, like whatever you get at the grocery store, pasta sauce, and they found out the reason was because like these the, the original Italian recipes they would actually the homemade stuff they would remove the skin and remove the seeds before they made it and then it was the skin uh, and the seeds that were causing a lot of that irritation from the raw tomato so um, might be a fun little n equals one experiment on your daughter if she's open to trying that out. <laughs> that's that is really interesting. You know when I I went to. Um, Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's house years back, they mentioned that one of the ways he was really radical is that he would grow and eat tomatoes and that was a big deal because they were considered to be toxic at the time. Mm. <laughs> right? And I mean a lot of these vegetables through breeding um, almonds for instance it, you know wild almonds are called bitter almonds and they're poisonous so I think it's because of cyanide um so a lot of the domestication of these plants has been to make them much less toxic to humans. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, I could totally see that that, you know, taking the skin and the seeds off, that's actually, that would be an interesting experiment. Because like apples, you don't eat the apple seeds because they are poisonous. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that's that's fascinating. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So I think, you know, you gotta you got to play around with it. I mean, I know, you know, amber, for instance, has violent reactions to vegetables, and I've heard the same story from a few other people. I don't think you're ever going to run into trouble from not eating it. There's just no, you know, there's nothing that you can't get from meat that you can, that you have to go to vegetables to get. Yeah. That we know of today. I'm trying to remember who said it, that might have been Mark or Chris Bell uh, on, the, on the Rogan podcast not too long ago. He said uh, that there was a study, and I was going to try to find it, and I didn't get around to it, that did this massive look at, like, the health benefits of vegetables. And at the end of the study, it basically the conclusion was, like, probably won't hurt you, probably won't help you. So it's kind of a yep. wash. So then it's, like, at that point, then you have to ask yourself, is this, am I one of the people on the far end where it just wrecks my digestion, or am I the one on the other end where I can get away for some of it, so if I enjoy eating them, then I guess I can have some. Yeah, they were referring yeah. to. He was referring to the Pure study that came out just recently, and, and one of their conclusions right. was uh, vegetable. They were they were considered neutral. They didn't really help. They didn't really hurt. Mm -hmm. And I and I agree with I agree with Tucker. You know, incidentally, just because I choose to stick to a pretty much carnivorous diet, I think if you can tolerate those things, that's fine. You know, you need to often say whether you can truly tolerate them or not. And I think that's where we have this sort of magic halo around fruits and vegetables like there's only chemicals they the only chemicals they have are designed for us and are good and healthy for us. And and, and when reality is they've got a whole bunch of chemicals, some of which may be of benefits, but some of which may be a net negative for you. And so I think that's the way to look at that. Um, you know, there is, you know, these these sort of uh, uh, epidemiologic based sort of uh, uh, suggestions that we you know now now 10 servings a day I think is what they're up to now and basically what I see it is just it's just displacing the otherwise processed food you know if you're eating a, a banana or or, or, a, or a cucumber you're not going to likely eat a donut you know and I think that's mm -hmm. just really the only benefit to that in my view I have this sort of sort of basic heuristic where I say anything that displaces meat out of the diet is a negative and anything that displaces donuts out of the diet is a, is a positive and I think that's yeah. as simple as that 
Yeah, totally agree. Um, so the other thing I got into, what actually got me into the whole diet realm was uh, um, barefoot slash minimalist running, uh, which I know is a special. You set your world record, Zach, if I remember correctly, in a pair of Scora minimalist running shoes. Yeah, yeah. I, I the furthest I've actually the, the furthest I've ran in a pair of minimal shoes is 125 miles, and, and, and ironically, oh, that's the furthest I've ran nice. actually too. So he's such a slacker. Yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> I in, in 2013 when I broke the 100 mile American record and the 12 hour world record, I had on a pair of Scora. Uh, I can't remember what they were, but you know, essentially just like a little bit of fabric on the top and a slab of rubber. And then 2014. When I uh, broke the 200 kilometer track record, um, that was in a pair of the Ultra Three Suns, which was basically a slab of rubber with an upper on it. And you know, it's just one of those things where I'm sure you can share some of your experience with this as well. It's like, you know, your leg muscles, your lower leg muscles, are like any other muscle in your body. If you work on them long enough, you can get, you can really develop them to be strong. It's like. You, you look at some of these, like, strong men, those guys didn't get like that in a week. They got like that over decades of weightlifting, training, right. and all that stuff. So, like, kind of getting into that type of a world where you're essentially moving yourself down to just having a real thin piece of rubber between your foot and the ground. You know, if you've been wearing a traditional shoe your whole life, which most people have, you've essentially had a cast on your foot. So, I just say to people, like, you know, if you want to get down into a more natural shoe, which you probably should for long-term benefits you know, work your way down into it just like you would if you broke your arm and then went back to the weight room after you got that cast off. You're going to start slow and slowly work those muscles and eventually they're going to get stronger. They're going to get um, more resilient and then you're going to be less likely to get all those lower leg injuries that you would have in the, in the first place. So um, treat it like any other muscle in your body. Yeah, I my first uh, walk in minimalist shoes, which was a pair of Vibrams, um, five fingers, I was able to walk about a mile before the pain in my in the muscles in my feet got so excruciating mm -hmm. that I couldn't continue anymore. And I was a hiker, mm -hmm. a lifelong hiker. So that, you know, and got to the point where doing 20 miles up and down Pikes Peak was nothing. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's interesting, too. Like, I'll talk to people and they'll say, I can't wear a, a shoe like that because my, my arches are flat and I have flat feet. <laughs> and my, 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 I, you know, I'm, I'm usually pretty gentle about it because you're not, I'm not trying to offend anyone, but I'm like, the reason that your arches are like that are most likely because you atrophy the muscles that would pull them up. So by working yourself back into a more natural, like foot placement, you know, eventually you're going to see those muscles pull that arch back up and you're not going to have that collapsed foot any longer. So, I mean, it's just like, you're more diplomatic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's exact. That's exactly right. You're 100 percent right. That's exactly what causes flat feet. And interestingly enough, high arches too. Yeah, it kind of hits uh, on both ends. Yeah, but yeah. um, that's, well, I'm, yeah, I mean that's probably for most people. There's people that have posterior tibial uh, tendon insufficiency and advanced stages of that, where the foot flattens out and collapses, and those things are probably beyond that. But I mean, I think for the average normal person, that's probably true. With with just like anything, atrophy we have. We have a big issue with atrophy in society these days anyway. <laughs> you know, as yeah. much as we have an obesity epidemic, we have a frailty epidemic. And I and I sort of constantly say we've got to, you know, you've got to do what you need to do to prevent that, whether it's resistance training, whether it's nutrition in your diet. I think there's a whole bunch of things that go into that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's just a, you know, one of the thousands of things we can talk about that, that are related to you know, not utilizing our body like it's designed to be used. No, and one of the fantastic things I think about your guys' podcast and the two of you being on it, the opposite extremes of a lot of, the opposite ends of a spectrum that a lot of people think are incompatible is you really do need to do both. I mean, you're both opposite ends, but ideally, you know, I don't know how much weight training you do, Zach, but I know most of the trail running gurus say that it's essential. Mm -hmm. I weight train, one of the primary reasons that I weight train is so if I trip on the trail, I can catch my body weight with my arms. Right, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, hey, uh -huh. that's, yeah. that's really practical. You see these scrawny-armed marathon runners out on the road. Right. And if they face plant, they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, it, and Sean, you used to run a lot as a rugby player, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's not like I, all I do is lift weights and do one or two. I mean, I do quite a bit of interval training. I do a lot of sprinting. I, you know, I'll spend 45 minutes to an hour doing uh, intense, you know, interval work. So it's not like I'm totally neglecting my cardiovascular system. In fact, it's fairly decent. You know, one of the things I'll talk because to, to Zach's point, you know, to, to, when you get to the top level and world class level, you know, sometimes. You know, Zach can't afford to have too much muscle on him. If you look at the Tour de France right. guys, you know, they have to have small, skinny upper bodies or they never, yeah. ever, they never, ever succeed. And so we have to, you know, we have to, we have to sort of put this language in. Who are we talking to? We're talking to the general public. Yeah, you need to develop everything as, as good as possible. If you're, if you're at the edge, the, the outer edge, you know, you need to do what you need to do to win. And sometimes that means, you know, you, you can't carry a lot of muscle mass on you. Now, I don't know what Jack does personally, and maybe he can tell us about that. But uh, I would suspect he's not doing a lot of triple deadlifts. Very often. <laughs> Actually, you know, I stay away from doing too much heavy upper body stuff. I certainly do like some core strengthening things, but you know, not a lot of bench press and that sort. But what I, I do go pretty heavy with, like, leg stuff during certain phases of the season um, because I think there's just uh, – there's there's something there's something to be said about just like that kind of neurological connection that you're gonna get by doing those basic like heavy moving lifts, um, and like I think it's just it's good for overall like injury prevention too to have like strong tendons, ligaments, and muscles in your legs, and sometimes that you you have times during the season where you can fit those in and. Um, I mean, if you look at a lot of the professional track and field runners, you know, they're, they're going into the gym and they're doing some form of mobility and strength work. And it, it's more recently skewed more towards heavier stuff as opposed to what your traditional endurance program is going to look like where they do some circuit training where they're doing like 20, 30 reps of, you know, some eight pound dumbbell or something like that. And, you know, it's, it, it's something I think that can be programmed into your stuff. And, you know, sometimes you'll see coaches say like, you know, if you have the time to go to the weight room, you should just be spending more time running. And it's like, that's kind of, in my opinion... They say that's a runner. Well, <laughs> yeah, and, and I think to some degree that's just a little bit of laziness too because they're, you know, as a coach, they're probably thinking to themselves, I've got this, this information that is valuable on the running side of things. I have no clue what to tell this person to do in the weight room. So the easy way out is to say you don't need to do it. Um, and then, right. you know, a lot of times people are they're coaching someone who's got a busy schedule and they're, they're, they're probably thinking, well, if I'm going to make them successful, the most bang for the buck is going to be running, not weightlifting. And, you know, as a coach, I'm sure they're trying to kind of have their clients be successful because that kind of keeps the business moving. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's definitely a, a place for strength work. Um, I think if you look at some of the more recent studies and the most more recent information and programming for that stuff, it, it, it does kind of even, skewed towards heavier stuff during certain parts of the year, especially with the legs. Hey, I've got a, just a, you, you touched on a point when you talk about mobility work, and this is something that I've sort of noticed over the years, you know, particularly with as it pertains to that. You know, we have this sort of, I call it an epidemic of stiffness. You know, we have people now that are, you know, I, I, go to, I go to the gym, I watch people warm up, and they spend half an hour rolling around on foam, you know, foam rollers <laughs> and stretching. And I mean, and literally, I'm halfway through my workout before these guys are even started. And I just have to think that, you know, some of this has to do with maybe it's the, maybe it's the Omega-6 oils that we're, yeah. getting, we're getting stiffer. Because, you know, you look at little kids. Kids are running around. there. They don't spend 20 minutes warming up before they go out running and playing. And I, and I don't. I just go to the gym. I might spend five minutes getting warm, you know, jumping rope a little bit. And then I'm, then, I'm after, then I'm at it full speed ahead. And, you know, like I said, the guy next to me is still rolling on his foam roller by the time I finish my eighth or ninth set. And I don't know if you guys have noticed a decreased need for stretching and, and, and all that mobility stuff by changing your diet because I certainly have and I just wonder if that's a common uh, well, I, sort of thing I know a lot of runners view stretching as um, not a necessary evil but just an evil so <laughs> I don't know I'm curious to hear if that actually stretches but <laughs> I do I personally just try and do some basic stretches like a potty squat and uh, you know sitting cross-legged and stuff like that just to keep up some function yeah, most of the stretching stuff I do is dynamic. Like, in terms of static stretching, I do very little or any of that. Every once in a while I will, just because I, if it feels good and it got a couple minutes. But, like, um, foam rolling, I think, is, it, it can, if you know what you're doing, it can be valuable. Like, if you know, like, some of the trigger points. And then it's it's actually not the, 
act of the rolling you're like rolling out the muscle belly is not going to really do anything but maybe push some inflammation out so it could be something to do with the omega sixes inflammations in there or swellings in there from whatever workout you did in the breakdown of the omega sixes and uh then you're just trying to push that or spread that out so you have like a little bit of relief um but really like when you do a real foam roll or a trigger point type session you're trying to pinpoint an area probably where like uh where your muscles are kind of converging so like the top of the hamstring where the glute meets and you're trying to get that that device in there and then you're trying to like move your leg in its natural movement movements in the muscle and so try to like kind of flex that muscle with that pressure point on that connection area and that's what's probably going to cause the most like release um from my experience so uh it uh, there's a lot of stuff that people are doing that i think they're they mean well and they're they're kind of half following the right way to do stuff, but they're, they just don't really know the proper way to kind of go about it. And that's where it, it just becomes kind of a wash at that point. Yeah. I just wonder, you know, what causes the need to even do that? You know, you talk about trigger points where well, you got to assume there's, there's some kind of damage or, you know, a trigger point to be there in the first place. And if you don't have those things, like for me, like I said, I'm in my fifties and I don't, I'm not stiff. I'm not, I'm not walking around sore, so I don't have to do that stuff. And I think, but you were, I, you were stiff and sore before. Yeah, no, I, that's yeah, no, I, no, absolutely. That's that's one of the big things I noticed going from being age 45 when it was a, you know, it, it took a long time to warm up. It was it was not fun going to the gym because you were sore most of the time. You had these achy, you know, different sort of tendonitis issues. And now in my 50s, I don't have any of that stuff. And, and I, you know, yeah, I, I had a significant change in my diet, so I have to think that you know perhaps diet plays a role in this. No, oh, I think I know. I noticed the same thing with my skiing. I, I'm also I'm 50, and I went from, you know, basically skiing with old guys to skiing with 20 year olds, and stop being able to stop them. I mean, it was literally like dropping. I think one. Eight, Zach, you said the other day you've seen too many people just appear to roll back age with mm -hmm. dietary changes. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally one of those people. It was just you know, you know, when people come up to you and they think you're. <laughs> You're 20 years younger than you actually are. It's not a bad thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's the same thing. I, you know, certainly, uh, you know, if you talk to a vegan, they say I look like I'm 100 years old. But I mean, you know, it's got, you know, you? it's kind of, yeah. Well, yeah, that's the thing. You look like you're 80 and you're going to die, something like that. So it's kind of funny. But um, Tucker, just back to the the, the omega six oils. What you know, we talked about, you know, uh, sunburn and muscle muscle uh, inflammation. What what things can we implicate omega sixes in in general? What sort of disease processes? Just just a, just a kind of a general list of what you can think off the top of your head of things that are affected by that. Uh, it seems to be a basic mechanism in all of the chronic diseases. Um, the pay, uh, so all of them: diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, neurological disease. Um, the basic mechanism in all of them appears to be what happens to your mitochondria, which are the basic powerhouses of the cell. Um, too much omega-6 fat in your diet causes a change, you know, as I mentioned before with the cartilage, causes a change in the structure of your mitochondria and the composition of your mitochondria. That seems to be where these toxins are generated. Um, they go from there, they can go anywhere else out in your body. It's a primary cause of DNA damage. Uh, HNE, the chemical that I mentioned before, that's a breakdown product of omega-6 fats, preferentially damages the P53 gene, which is your primary cancer uh, repair gene. Um, they've seen that in both colon cancer and liver cancer. Um, I mean, what a lot of people, what people don't understand and what they need to understand is that even as far, even as recently as the 1960s and the 1970s, you were able to go around the world and find populations of people where they didn't get heart disease. There was a fantastic study done in the 1960s where they looked at Japanese, Koreans, and African Americans, you know, Japanese Americans, Korean Americans, and African Americans. And they compared them to Africans in Africa, Japanese in Japan, and Koreans in Korea. And the Japanese, the Koreans, and the Africans, their heart disease rates were near zero. Near zero, right? And then they looked at the same populations, so same genetics that had moved to the United States, 
and they had similar levels of disease as Americans whose you know ancestors had been here. This is a new problem that we're looking at. I think there's too much complacency, especially in the medical business, where they're like, oh, this is normal. No, this is not normal. You are seeing a series of sick people here in the United States, and it's not normal. It's new. It's new. It's a new problem. So why is, why is everybody in the world getting the same series of diseases as the American diet, and I will blame it on the Americans, gets introduced around the world, right? The most amazing story I heard was, um, and Sean, you'll appreciate this, because the vegans always like to go on about Okinawa, right? Which is the southernmost island in Japan. And they always say, oh, well, you know, the Okinawans eat a near vegan diet, and they were the longest lived people in the world. Well, half that's true. They were the longest lived people in the world. They ate the most meat in all of Japan. Right. So, so much for that argument. Um, but what's amazing and what's horrifying about the story of Okinawa is after World War II, the United States took over Okinawa as our base of operations. And we started bringing American fast food in. The first fast food restaurant in Japan opened in Okinawa nine years before one opened in Tokyo. The next generation of Okinawans went Okinawa went from having the longest lifespan in all of Japan to the shortest lifespan in all of Japan in one generation. Wow. Right? Parents were burying their children. It was an epidemic. And there's a scientist whose name escapes me. Maybe we can uh, tweet it out after this or add it to some show notes or something. He wrote a paper and he called this the ep the Excess linoleic acid syndrome. Linoleic acid is the primary omega-6 fat in the human diet and in seed oils. And he, he goes, you know, the paper was written in the 90s, and you read through it today. I only found this paper recently after having done all of my reading, and I was like, oh, my God, this guy got it all the way back then. And he goes through all the different diseases, because what happened to the poor Okinawans? They got fat, they got heart disease, and they got cancer. From, but their parents were the longest lived people in the world. How is that possible? Yeah, it must have been yeah, you know, crazy genetics. They, they mutated in one generation. Right? In one generation, right? It was, a, it was a miracle. And no, they weren't downwind from Hiroshima. Just in case you haven't been oh, yeah. that. So it's, you know, it's, sorry, I get, I get, you know, I get passionate about this. It's a, so yeah, the short answer is, all the chronic diseases seem to be related. As I've gone through it, Alzheimer's disease, you know, you can find papers that are coming out now where they're clearly pointing the finger. They all call it, in the medical literature, they generally call it oxidative stress. Um, but once you understand what oxidative stress is, it is the process of omega-6 fats breaking down into toxins in the body. That's what it is. And it seems to clearly be related to how much of them you're eating. And there's, you know, a couple of papers that are just starting to come out where they're actually reducing them in the diet, and then they're seeing what happens to people, and they're seeing some pretty remarkable results. So, do you do you have? Would you be able to ballpark a guess as to what the minimal dose for toxicity is for omega six in the diet? You know, like could you say you keep it below, you know, a certain amount? Is there any way to any kind of data that would support a, a, a sort of a, a an estimate on that? There's um, the best study I've seen on omega-6 fats. They were looking at non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which, Sean, I'm sure you know, has become a huge problem in the United States. Sure. Um, they got the omega-6 fats down to less than 3% of the diet by energy, and they had a 100% cure rate of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in six months. Their weight went down, their fasting insulin went down, and their home IR went down. So that's and now three percent of the total caloric intake in the diet. Is that what you're saying? Right. And right. What What do we typically eat these days? What do we have any a handle on how much we're eating as as a standard average American? Americans are seven to fifteen percent. So cut it by. You know, I mean, if you're eating donuts. <laughs> right. Well, it's, it's interesting, too, because, you know, donuts is an easy one to, to point at, too, but, like, you know, fast food french fries are the exact same things, you know, seed oils right. with a, a fast-release starch. It's like 
the two things that are going to oxidize the heaviest in your system are just put right together. And, you know, people are eating those on a daily basis in some cases. Well, we, yeah, I mean, it's everything. I mean, we see these things where they advertise the fact that it has canola oil or, or something like that. It's heart healthy. And, and you know, it's, 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 it's all these, you know, whatever processed food you have, it's in there. It's in the sauces. It's in the, you know, it's in, you know, I, I don't know if they put it in bread even. I don't know, but it's in, it seems to be in everything. I don't know. Can you speak to, speak to this, the ways they, they sneak it in the food? It's in everything. <laughs> it's in bread. What did they make? They used to make bread with butter, right? That's what my grandmother did. And now they don't use butter for anything because these, basically it's because this stuff is cheap is why it took off. Um, well, what was it like? But yeah, that's how, as you say, like like movie theaters used to use like coconut oil for their popcorn, and like I think McDonald's used to use like beef tallow, then switched to coconut oil, and then eventually switched to the vegetable oil when that got subsidized. So it's like That's right. you know it, you can look at some patterns in terms of when some of these things started becoming a big issue, and when some of these massive like places that are just you know putting out tons and tons of our of our of our food into the into the system are just. You're kind of loaded with that stuff, so it's a, it's an interesting thing, but scary, like we said earlier. <laughs> I mean, I'm 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 shocked that these food manufacturers would dare to put profits above personal health. I mean, I, I just can't believe that that happens. It's shocking. <laughs> I'm saying, oh, no, yeah. just, just, but, <laughs> but let me let me say something about that. They, you know, this stuff was introduced into our diet back in the eight, late 1800s after the Civil War from cottonseed oil, and they figured out cottonseed soil oil was toxic, and they figured out how to detoxify it. Um, the scientists didn't start to figure out what the problem was with these fats until the 1980s, right? The pathway I was talking about with the mitochondria, they only figured out in 2012. So for a long time, it's defensible that they thought they were doing something that was right. But we are now figuring out a hundred years later, oops, we got a problem. And industry is very aware of it. I mean, one of my favorite seed oil studies is a study that's comparing um, coconut oil to soybean oil to this new GMO uh, soybean oil called Plenish, right? And the point of the study is hey, look, our new GMO soybean oil cause, called Plenish causes less obesity than soybean oil, but it's still not as good as coconut oil, right? That was paid for by the manufacturer of Plenish. Their marketing line is, hey, look, it's less obesogenic. <laughs> it's like, it's, you know, I think it's like the, uh, you know, some, uh, this analogy has been going on a lot. It's like saying smoked, smoke filtered cigarettes instead of unfiltered cigarettes you know you'd be great you know that's the same sort of thing there so if we you know if if let's just sort of take a uh, uh, wild uh, supposition that they'll recognize that these omega-6 oils these seed oils are ultimately bad for the humans and they decide they're going to take them out of the diet where are we going to get our fat from uh, what are we going to do well i think you know the answer to that show <laughs> i will say it for you um ideally what do i eat Mostly animal fats, uh, the butter, pastured butter, I prefer. Um, I cook a little bit with coconut oil, and I cook a little bit with olive oil. I would guess I probably go through about 24 ounces of olive oil a year, um, a year, and maybe a half a jar of coconut oil a year. So I'm I'm betting on butter. Um, just because you brought that up, what do you think, you know, let's compare uh, coconut oil to canola oil? Because I get a lot of people ask me about olive oil and coconut oil. Where, where does that fall in this omega-6 spectrum? Is there a difference, you know, a qualitative or quantitative difference when we compare coconut oil versus safflower oil or sunflower oil or any of the other ones? Is there some that aren't as good as the other ones? There's a com total difference. Coconut oil, probably because it's from the tropics, is almost completely saturated fats. Um, I mean, it has some, you know, as I said at the beginning, all real foods have some omega-6. Coconut oil is, I think, like 0.06% or something. So it's not even an issue. It's coconut oil kind of bothers me because I like to call these things seed oils, but the coconut oil is the seed, is the healthy seed oil. So if you're going to, that's the one to eat without question. The, you know, after that, it's pretty much 
you know, as I said, industry is aware of these problems and they're working on it. There's GMO canola oil that has less omega-6 and more of the fats that are in olive oil. Um, there's what they call high lake sunflower oil um, that may be a better option for some people, depending on what their alternatives are. I mean, you know, there are vegetarians and folks out there. There's a great study out of uh, India where they compare, compared safflower oil to canola oil to olive oil in terms of weight loss and fasting insulin. And the people who switched from the safflower to the olive oil, their fasting in insulin levels just collapsed, right? Which implicates these seed oils, as Sean will know, as potentially a primary driver of diabetes because high fasting insulin is one of the signature features of type 2 diabetes. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, olive oils, I'm not crazy about it just because I don't really care for the taste, but that's probably one of your better options for a vegetable-based fat. Um, and the rest of the stuff, corn oil, you know, I hear it makes a nice biodiesel. <laughs> but I wouldn't eat it. But don't so and the, don't throw away your bacon grease and, and and don't forget to put butter on the shopping list. I guess is what you're trying to say in, in short. <laughs> yeah, and I've you know I've actually um, uh, as I mentioned, my ex-wife was Colombian and uh, her family when they moved up here, their doctor told them to switch to corn oil. And when I started getting on this diet, you know they would come over and do empanadas deep fried for Christmas and. The year I said, no, we're going to switch and do it in tallow, they were so thrilled. <laughs> they were like, that's what we used to use in Co Colombia. Mm -hmm. you know." And then the doctor told us to switch to corn oil when we moved up here. And they, they taste so much better when you cook them in tallow. Yeah. Well, and it's night and day. The, as, so, so we're not just going completely negative on this episode either. I think the cool thing too is we are seeing some momentum on that side in the sense that you can walk into a grocery store now and, and find a couple options with between just like you know, beef tallow or duck tallow type, or duck fat yeah. and stuff. So the stuff is starting to make its way to the market and hopefully we can continue to kind of have those type of options show up and uh, give people more than just you know the, the general fake food that you're seeing at the grocery store on a more regular basis. Yeah, well, people people like to beat on industry, but you know what? Industry, if we're going to turn this around, that's how it's going to happen right. because they mm -hmm. listen. And when I did this nine years ago, when I started doing this nine years ago, it was impossible. It was impossible to mm -hmm. do. You couldn't find this stuff anywhere. And now you had to go to like a specialty store. I had to go to a specialty health food store to get my first bottle of coconut oil. And... The coconut oil that I've got in the cloth in the pantry right now has a Crisco label on it. <laughs> so Crisco has turned from selling trans fats to selling cold virgin pressed coconut oil. Mm -hmm. So they are listening yep. and they are changing. Well, that's the, that is it. At the end of the day, like they're going to make what people want to buy because they're looking to sell stuff. So if people recognize that that's what they need and want and start asking for it, yeah. these. They, they, these places have the infrastructure to make it in massive when society demands it. So um, it's it, it'll be good to have that infrastructure there when when it completely turns ship. Um, but yeah, yeah. so so cool. vote with your wallet, definitely. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, when I you know when you go to the grocery store and you see all this junk food that's in the grocery store, you're like, well, who the heck buys it? Well, the reason it's there is because lots of people buy it. Right. And, you know, I think right. you know that's why it's there. People are buying it, and so yeah, I mean, it's going to be a sort of a grassroots bottom up effort, you know, and until that happens, until those, you know, vegetable oil laden potato chips sit on the shelves for three years like they probably could. <laughs> <laughs> and when no one buys them, they're gonna they're gonna continue to produce those things. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, you know, little by little we can slowly uh, turn the tide here, you know. But there's I've also noticed just, you know, from listening to pop culture that um, people are starting to recognize that low carb is the way to lose weight. Mm -hmm. Even when I go into medical offices um, you know, my father was just in the hospital and I said, oh, well, he's, you know, he's lost a lot of weight over the last year. And they were like, oh, so he's on a low carb diet. <laughs> <laughs> he is in fact, and yes, that's why he lost the weight. But I was shocked. I mean, you know, I'm unfortunately old enough to remember how demonized Dr. Atkins was. And 
everybody seems to be coming around. There seems to be this groundswell of people recognizing, hey, we're all sick and it's because of the food. Well, I I mean, think, it's not going to happen overnight. But I, I think the biggest driver of that, in my view, is our interconnectedness via social media now. And so we have so many people that are talking to each other. We have so much access to information and other people in the same situation. I think that's, that's, that's a huge driver in this. You know? And I think the perception that, yeah, you can lose weight on a ketogenic diet or a low-carb diet, that's pretty well accepted. Even the people that hate the diet will admit that. But the, 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 the next hurdle is saying, well, it's not sustainable and ultimately it's going to kill you of heart disease. And that's, that's where we've got to sort of uh, make a dent. And I'm looking to see you know, people that have been on low-carb or high-fat or ketogenic diets and let's see what happens five years into their you know, coronary vessels or their carotid arteries. And that's where we, we really see where the rubber meets the road because right now we're seeing, you know, well, you went on a, a, you know, on a ketogenic diet and look, your LDL skyrocketed up to 190 or 210 and now you're definitely going to die. And there, there's, there's going to be a cohort of those people that say, I don't care, I feel great. And let's just see what happens to their vessels because I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing anecdotally already people showing that their vessels look great. I mean, they're, they're clean as a whistle. And, and I would been expect it. I think you mentioned that you've seen a couple of people where they're actually regressing their atherosclerosis. Yeah, yeah, guy we're going to have on the show in the, in the coming weeks when he gets back from Australia, Dave Feldman. He's, he showed that his, his uh, coronary artery uh, intermediate thickness has gone down, which is, you know, is a uh, measure of how much plaque is in the car carotid artery, and he's seeing that go down and down over the years. And so that's, you know, again. And given, no given that standard medicine tells you that's impossible, that's a rather interesting finding. Yeah, and so you know, hopefully we'll be able within the next few years we'll have we'll be able to counter that. Well, the only study ever proven to reverse coronary vessel disease is the is the Ornish you know you know thing they always trot out, and you know it's right. obviously that thing was no smoking, no drinking, you know, exercise, meditation, all the other stuff included included in there, and then there's no seed oils. Also, right, yeah, yeah, well, no, no seed oils in there. Fact, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and so low carb. Yeah, so it's and it was low carb too. <laughs> Yeah, he well, not too crazy low carb, but it's yeah. they want you to eat, you know, tons wasn't of fiber. Sugar, well, it wasn't sugar, right? Yeah, basically. So yeah. lower carb, yeah. Interesting. Well, Zach, I think we we've kept Tucker for, yeah. for, for, for a while here. I've got a lot of good information on this one. It's gonna be a pleasure to let people listen to this and keep going and maybe we can get Tucker back down the road as more developments happen for, in the world of, you know, health and nutrition. For sure. I, I'd be thrilled to and I'm I'm honored you two guys asked me uh, to talk to you on this podcast um i admire and respect both the work that both of you are doing on social media and you know helping people see that this is i've always said that i think the healthy human diet is the one that not only helps you cure your diseases like diabetes and obesity but helps you be a world champion athlete and you guys are proving that it's well, the same thing there's one answer yeah well, well thanks thanks again I yeah. I, I told I told Twitter that you were going to drop some knowledge on us today, and they should be ready for our content-heavy episode six. And I think you you delivered. So um, uh, definitely uh, take a second here and share with the listeners where they can find you if you'd like before we sign out. Yeah, my Twitter handle is pretty simple. It's at Tucker Goodrich. Uh, my profile there, I have a link to my blog, uh, which is called Yelling Stop, and I've got a couple thousand articles that I've put up there over the last nine years, long, some longer form stuff, and just a lot of links to interesting studies and things I found of interest over the years, including my most popular blog post ever, which was a discussion of Zach Bitter's diet from 2015, I think, maybe, or a couple of years before that. But And make sure you read the comments on that post, because that Zach clarifies a couple of things like his beer consumption <laughs> yeah, yeah i would encourage anyone to follow tucker on, on twitter i mean he, he's always putting up some very provocative and interesting studies and, and well defended you know he, he doesn't come out there just, i you know i've been accused of a little bit of hyperbole which which some of that isn't intentional it's 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 sort of to uh you know get the get the message out and to get the people to look to see what's going on but tucker is pretty you know solid and fact-based and it's nice to have that sort of uh, research so so please utilize that Thanks, guys. Great talking to you. All right. Take care. Hey, folks. Thanks again for tuning in to the Human Performance Outliers podcast. Just a couple quick notes before you leave. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us at hpopodcast at gmail.com. That's hpopodcast at gmail.com. We're both also on social media. 
on Twitter, you can find me at ZBitter. That's at Z B I T T E R. And you can find Sean at S Baker M D. That's at S B A K E R M D. We're both also on Instagram, where you can find me at Zach Bitter. That's at Z A C H B I T T E R. And for Sean, it's at Sean Baker 1967. That's at S H A W N B A K E R 1967. Thanks again for tuning in to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast.